We come now to the 31st study period here at the British Columbian Camp 1984 and this is the 7.30 period on, Wednesday, on Thursday evening the 30th of August. Tomorrow's the last day of August I see. I want tonight to um, have a second gospel study like we had last night and it'll be a little different of course. And uh, we'll turn to Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17 as our opening text this evening. Matthew 8 and verse 17. Perhaps I should take verse 16 and 17 to um, develop the full context to the point I wish to make. When the even was come, they brought unto him many who were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Let's go back to the actual verse in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4, which is being quoted here. Remember the Gospel writer Matthew said, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah or Isaiah the prophet saying. We just compare the actual original scripture with the one given to us in Matthew the 8th chapter. Isaiah chapter 53, that wonderful chapter which foretold the sufferings and death of Jesus Christ. Now it says in verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. The wording as you recognise is somewhat different. In fact it's quite different. Yet uh, we must recognise of course that the version given in the book of Matthew is an illumination or an interpretation or an explanation of the verse found back in Isaiah chapter 53. So in Isaiah 53 it says in verse 4, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Matthew chapter 8 says, He himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now it's very easy to recognise of course that a sickness is a grief or a sorrow. But there are lots of griefs and sorrows apart from being sick aren't there? Although if a person really gets sick, they certainly uh, experience great uh, grief and sorrow. So Jesus Christ actually bore our sicknesses and carried our infirmities when he was down here upon this earth. This takes my mind back to things as they were shortly after the creation of this world. And in Testimonies, Volume 3, page 1, 3, 8 and 9, I read these significant words in regard to the increase of disease upon the human family. The book of Genesis gives quite a definite account of, the, of social and individual life, and yet we have no record of an infant being born blind, deaf, crippled, deformed or imbecile. Today, this is becoming an increasingly common occurrence to find children born deformed, crippled, blind, imbecile and the like. I, I guess over here too, I know in Australia there are actual quite sizable homes devoted to caring for abnormal children, subnormal and abnormal children. Some with speech defects, some with uh, deformities of their physical bodies, mostly mental, mentally retarded. There's an increasing number of children born with uh, defective livers and hearts and, and both liver and heart transplants today are quite common in Australia for children under two years of age, which of course is absolutely incredible. But in the book of Genesis there is no such record. Never do you find one single instance in the first two, almost 2,000 years of human history, and Genesis covers over 2,000 years of human history from the creation through the flood, the flood being 1656 years after the fall and Abraham lived about 2,000 years after, after the creation of man. Of course Genesis takes us beyond that uh, through the life story of uh, Jacob and I mean, Isaac and Jacob and the 12 sons of Jacob and so on down to the actual sojourn in Egypt and Exodus opens some 400 years later with the time of the advent from that land. Let's read now a little further. 138 volume 1 or volume 3 of the testimonies there is not an instance upon record of a natural death in infancy, childhood or early manhood of course there are unnatural deaths because of the violence of mankind there were murders back there but there are no natural deaths in infancy, childhood or early manhood 
There is no account of men and women dying of disease. Obituary notices in the book of Genesis run thus, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Concerning others, the record states he lived to be a good old age and he died. It was so rare for a son to die before the father that such an occurrence was considered worthy of record. And Haran died before his father Terah. Haran was the father of children before his death. Now why was it that even though sin had entered upon the scene, and as we know of course that uh, sickness is sin because uh, sickness produces death, or sin, sin produces sickness and sickness produces death. So just as surely as sin had entered, we must expect that sickness would very quickly follow, but it didn't quickly follow, and here's the reason why. God endowed man with so great vital force that he has withstood the accumulation of disease brought upon the race in consequence of perverted habits and has continued for 6,000 years. This fact of itself is enough to evidence to us the strength and electrical energy that God gave to man at his creation. It took more than 2,000 years of crime and indulgence of base passions to bring bodily disease upon the race to any great extent. 2,000 years. As I mentioned a moment ago, of course, this brings us down to about, 400, about 350 years after the flood, which was in 1656 right down to the days of Abraham and his son Isaac. Now, up until that point of time, there was very little sickness seen in the human family. They were men and women of tremendous vitality and, uh, and, and health and strength. Now, Sister White goes on to say, if Adam, at his creation, had not been endowed with, with 20 times as much vital force as men now have, the race with their present habits of living in violation of natural law would have become extinct. Now, stop for a moment and, and uh, envy our father Adam. Twenty times the electrical energy in his mind, or twenty times as much vital force as men now have. We know, of course, there's something like twelve feet tall, which is about twice as tall as I am, way up there somewhere with his head to the ceiling and naturally beautifully proportioned so imagine how broad he must have been and what magnificent arms and legs and muscles he must have possessed what uh, endurance he must have had in fact if today he'd run the marathon race he'd leave all the runners far behind and run, run around the course two or three times and still not be winded at the end of his time but just imagine that if you were in a classroom today I think of this boys and girls and children and young, young people who still are doing schooling Imagine if you had 10% more mental power than you presently have, you'd certainly be top of the class, wouldn't you? Or at least, say, 20%. But imagine having 20 times as much intellectual power as you now have. 20 times. While well, you'd gobble up primary school and high school by the time of six, wouldn't you? <laughs> by the time you'd got to about seven, you'd be through with the university and ready for your life's work. <laughs> In, I mean, the original specimen of mankind must have been a fantastic man an incredible man, uh, even surpassing anything we, we could imagine at the present time, he would be a real superman to say the least of it. Now so vital, so energetic, so healthy, so resistant to disease was the early man that for two, but even though the folk before the flood and after the flood lived lives of wanton abuse of their physical powers and they could do it with impunity up for, for the first thousand years at least, even though they lived in wanton violation of, of God's laws of health and strength, they, there was no significant incidence of disease amongst them for the first 2,000 years of human history. And the remaining 4,000 years of time down to our present day uh, has been possible because of that uh, start that was given to man in the beginning. But the credit is being used up, the bank account is being drained, and today once again a fearful weight of disease and sickness is descending upon the human family. It's, a, it's on every side of us, as it was back in the days of Jesus Christ. Now I read now, page 139, volume 3, at the time of Christ's first advent, the race had degenerated so rapidly that an accumulation of disease pressed upon that generation, bringing in a tide of woe and a weight of misery inexpressible. 
Now when you read of course the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke and, Luke and John we have a very different picture from the book of Genesis. Genesis, a book that does not record any diseases in the human family, no sicknesses whatsoever. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John which record hardly anything else. And when Christ came to this earth after 4,000 years of wanton violation of divine law, the indulgence of every base passion and appetite and the disregard of every principle of righteousness, the human family was a very, very sick family, so much so that Jesus spent practically all of his time in the ministry for the sick. He also spent some time preaching, but it was always interspersed with a great deal of healing for the sick of that time. Now, we know that Jesus Christ inherited in that context, in that atmosphere, in that situation, the same fallen sinful flesh and blood which every other human being had around about him. In other words, the people around about him inherited their sicknesses. They inherited the weaknesses, the frailties and all that which, which laid them wide open for infection. And the infection poured in and they were lame, they were halt, they were blind, they were crippled, they were palsy, they were lepers. There was sickness in every hand. It must have been a rather dreadful sight to walk amongst those people back in the days of Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus Christ was possessed of the same body as they had, and he certainly was possessed of the same body as they had, and if he bore our sicknesses and took our infirmities in that fallen, sinful, mortal flesh and blood body, weakened by 4,000 years of sin, then how come he himself never got sick? We never read a single instance of Christ being sick, do we? Not even a snuffle, or a cold, or a headache, if he had it, it isn't recorded, I'm sure if he had it, it would have been recorded because it would have been a most significant event indeed. So how come then that Jesus Christ was never sick? Let's turn to the book Ministry of Healing, page 51, and here we have a significant paragraph in regard to this particular point, 51 in the book Ministry of Healing. Jesus was an earnest, constant worker never lived there among men another so weighted with responsibilities never another carried so heavy a burden of the, of the world's sorrow and sin never another toil with such self-consuming zeal for the good of men and that word self-consuming of course means self-destroying self-sacrificing self-expending which of course is rather is, which is against the laws of self-preservation and uh is a sacrifice of love for perishing humanity yet his was a life of health physically as well as spiritually he was represented by the sacrificial lamb without spot without blemish and without spot first peter 1 verse 19 in body as in soul he was an example of what god designed all humanity to be through obedience to his laws now in the past we have stressed and stressed correctly and quite strongly that Jesus, that Jesus Christ's perfect righteousness is a witness to what God, God plans that we shall be even in this present generation. As he was, so are we to be. And of course last year and probably again by tomorrow as we've been earnestly requested to do so we learned that not only was the man Christ Jesus the model for men and women today, but the baby Christ Jesus is also a model for babies today, and the boy Christ Jesus is likewise for boys and girls today, and the youth for the youth of today. In other words, from his earliest moment to his dying breath, the life of Christ upon this earth is a picture of what babies and children and youths and men and women can be and are to be in God's great plan. Remember the statement on page 664 of Desire of Ages that Jesus Christ revealed no qualities uh, Yes, man, I've just forgotten now. He, he possessed no qualities and revealed no... What's the other word? Um, I told, my terrible memory is forgotten so I'll have to look it up. 664 in the book Desire of Ages. Right. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they'll be in subjection to God as he was. 
He revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that you and I can't have. And this is true, of course, through childhood and all the way up along the line. Now we ask the question then, how come that Jesus Christ, inheriting the same fragile, weakened, sinful flesh and blood body that others around him had possessed, or also possessed, that un and that because they around him had those weakened, sinful, mortal human flesh and blood bodies, they were palsied, they were blind, they were sick, they were maimed, they were diseased, they were lep leprous and so forth, and therefore Jesus Christ ought also to have been in the same situation as they. In other words, they were a picture of what Christ also should have been if we consider nothing more than the fact that both he and they possessed the same flesh and blood body, which was after, after 4,000 years so susceptible to sickness and disease. Now, why did not Jesus share in the sickness of the rest? Why was he instead a picture of what they might have been instead of he being also what they actually were? Let's turn now to the spiritual side of the question and uh, we'll look at the state of spiritual things back in the days of Jesus Christ and we'll find that they were just as bad as the physical. I turn to page 36 in the book Desire of Ages. Page 36 which reads as follows. The, uh, speaking about the condition of things in Christ's day at the time of his first advent and this is, is talking mainly of the spiritual but also refers to the physical it says that the deception of sin had reached its height all the agencies for depraving the souls of men had been put in operation the son of God looking upon the world beheld suffering and misery with pity he saw how men had become victims of, of satanic cruelty he looked with compassion upon those who were being corrupted, murdered and lost. They had chosen a ruler who chained them to his car as captives. Bewildered and deceived, they were moving on in gloomy procession toward eternal ruin, to death in which was no hope of life, toward night to which comes no morning. Satanic agencies were incorporated with men, the bodies of human beings made for the dwelling place of God had become the habitation of demons. The senses, the nerves, the passions, the organs of men were worked by supernatural agencies and the indulgence of the vilest lust. The very stamp of demons was impressed upon the countenances of men. Human faces reflected the expressions of, leg of the legions of evil with which they were possessed. Such was the prospect upon which the world's redeemer looked. What a spectacle for infinite purity to behold. <clears throat> Now just going back a paragraph <clears throat> we read on the same page the people whom God had called to be the pillar and ground of the truth become representatives of Satan they were doing the work that he desired them to do taking a course to misrepresent the character of God and cause the world to look upon him as a tyrant the very priests who ministered in the temple had lost sight of the significance of the service they performed they had ceased to look beyond the symbols of the things signified in presenting the sacrificial offerings they were as actors in a play. The ordinances which God himself had appointed were made the means of blinding the mind and hardening the heart. God could do no more for man through these channels. The whole system must be swept away. And page 37, sin had become a science and vice was consecrated as a part of religion. Rebellion had struck its roots deep into the heart and the hostility of man was most violent against heaven. It was demonstrated before the universe that apart from God, humanity could not be uplifted. A new element of life and power must be imparted by him who made the world. Sin had become a science. Its deception had reached its heights. All the agencies for depraving the souls of men had been put in operation. Rebellion had struck its roots deep into the heart and the hostility of man was most violent against heaven. So the picture of utter degeneration and disease in the physical world was matched by the controlling power of sin and the degradation of sin in the spiritual world. The two went very, very much together. And when Christ came to this world, men knew neither victory over sin nor victory over disease, right? They knew neither. 
uh, as is proved of course by the fact that they were ground down by these two oppressive forces sickness and sin or sin and sickness because sin always should come first of course there's only one reason why Jesus Christ did not share in the sinfulness of that age and generation. It was because he had the victory over sin, right? Now, one thing I must stress tonight, and that is this, that victory over sin is not the triumph of the will over the power of sin. It is not the triumph of the will over the power of sin. That is a false theology. We examined, we examined that today in brief in our morning study period when we looked at the law in Galatians and we saw how the when men by the power of the will with God's help attempt or supposedly with God's help but not actually with God's help but supposedly with God's help attempt to suppress and control the rising tide of evil that that kind of theology actually exalts man as the saviour above God who is relegated or reduced to being a mere helper to the human saviour and that theology, of course, is utterly false and untrue. So, victory over sin is not the triumph of the will over the sinful nature. It is not the suppression and control of the sinful nature. That's the modified improvement. And that's not the Christian life, as Sister White plainly says in the same book, Desire of Ages. Victory over sin is a presence within the person. As you read in Ephesians, the third chapter, He is our peace. And peace is what? Victory. A person who is defeated is never happy and he's certainly not at peace. <clears throat> that's, that's an impossibility. We, we find ourselves, of course, uh, unless, unless we've abandoned all hope and just left ourselves uh, collapse, as you might say, we might perhaps have a little bit of peace. <clears throat> then it's like the man who ran away from the battlefront and found things so lovely and peaceful or far away from the battlefront. Let me say it again then, that the victory is the presence of God in the soul. Victory is, the, in our case of course, is the presence of Jesus. In the case of Christ, it was the presence of divinity housed in sinful humanity. And that presence in his body gave him complete victory over sin, so that even though he has sinful flesh, he certainly never had sinning flesh. Never. Now, we know of course that... Um, God employs only one gospel to bring to the human family both spiritual and physical deliverance. Let me turn across in the book Ministry of Healing to the reference which tells us that on page 111 of uh, this book. The chapter is called The Co-working of the Divine and the Human. In the Ministry of Healing the physician is to be a co-worker with Christ. Now we work, co-working means to work together with him. Now he is the worker, we are the co-workers. Therefore he is the leader, the one who makes the decisions, he is the head, he is the plan maker, the burden bearer and the problem solver and we are the dependent co-workers to go along with him in his work. The Saviour ministered to both the soul and the body. The Gospel which he taught, and note that, the Gospel it, is, it doesn't say one gospel which he taught, but the gospel, and not the gospels, but the gospel singular, which he taught was a message of spiritual life and of physical restoration. One gospel, and that gospel was a message of spiritual life and of physical restoration. Deliverance from sin and the healing of disease were linked together. The same ministry is committed to the Christian physician. He is, to, he is to unite with Christ in relieving both the physical and spiritual needs of his fellow men. He is to be to the sick a messenger of mercy, bringing to them a remedy for the diseased body and for the sin-sick soul. Now, it is because in Jesus Christ divinity and humanity were combined, it is because the divine nature of the eternal God was tabernacled in human flesh and blood that Jesus Christ had the perfect and complete victory over every possible sin in his life. Of course, I'm not, I'm not overlooking the fact that day by day Jesus Christ set his will to obey the Heavenly Father and he was very careful to ensure that he did not let any laxity or... Uh, or uh, carelessness enter in to give Satan the advantage. He was ever on guard and came through every battle totally victorious. But no matter how vigilant he might have been, 
no matter how careful, no matter how faithful, if he'd not had in him the life of God, he could not have had the victory over sin during his lifetime upon this earth. Now in like manner, Jesus Christ had the victory over disease. He had the victory over disease and that victory again was the life of God in his body. And while the life of God reigned in his mortal flesh and he maintained that victory over sickness and disease, there was no way he could become a sick person. He did not become a sick person for his entire sojourn down here upon this earth. Now, when we read a moment ago that in body as well as in soul, page 51 in the book Ministry of Healing, Jesus Christ was a model of what we are to be. I'll read the exact words now. Page 51 in the book Ministry of Healing. In body as in soul, that is in the physical as in the spiritual, he was an example of what God designed all humanity to be through obedience to his laws in body as in soul. So therefore the health which Jesus Christ enjoyed is the health that we are to enjoy. The victory which he had is the victory which we are to have. The freedom from sickness which he enjoyed we too are to enjoy just as we are to enjoy freedom from sin as well. Let's review now for a few moments some of the great statements in the book Ministry of Healing which make it very very clear that uh, God's way of healing is the way of victory over disease and that way is the inflowing of his own life into the needy human being down upon this earth. So I turn now to page uh, 114 and 15 of the book Ministry of Healing and uh, I now read some statements which, we, which, which we'll need to look at carefully to make sure we don't misunderstand them. Let it be made plain that the way of God's commandments is the way of life. God has established the laws of nature, but his laws are not arbitrary exactions. Every thou shalt not, whether in physical or in moral law, implies a promise. If we obey it, blessing will attend our steps. God never forces us to do right, but he seeks to save us from the evil and lead us to the good. Now, of course, the those who don't understand the living principles of... Um, God's way of doing things, the principle that um, the law is a life preserver and not a life giver would misinterpret the word when it says that the way of God's commandments is the way of life. That is true for the living and it is true for whatever is living in you because in order to, to, to keep alive and living that which is in you we obey the law because the law is a life preserver, not a life giver. But where in there is death in our beings, uh, an organ which is not functioning properly or some part of our body organism which is in disarray because of the death, because death reigns there, then the only person who can possibly bring restoration to that dead organ or part of our body is God to the inflow of his life. No one else but he can do that. I just... Um, repeat a point I made several years ago for those who didn't hear it back then and the point is this if I, if I make the statement the, the broken law is a life taker you'd hardly agree would you not breaking the law takes our lives and therefore the broken law is a life taker in fact uh, in um, Great Controversy page 418 Sister White there says that the broken law um demands the life of the sinner, right? The broken law demands the life of the sinner and will have what it demands. Now having made the point then that the broken law is a life taker, I ask the question, what then is the unbroken law or obedience? It is a life? Right, you've all heard the story before. I'm glad to see you've learned. <laughs> if you hadn't been educated uh, in this point, then you, then you would have made the standard answer which I have gotten, which I got back from you folk in the first instance, remember, when I first asked you, you came back with it's a life giver. And all around the world, it's a rare thing, I think about only one person, named, named the Elder Whelan, of the Whelan and Short duo, he's about the only person I remember now who came back with the answer, it's not, it's a life sustainer, I think he said, which means the same as a life preserver. So when people say to me, the unbroken law is a life giver, I then ask the question, well, what is God? And they said, well, he's the life giver. Well, do we have two life givers? No, we don't. 
and then becomes apparent of course that the unbroken law or obedience is a life sustainer or a life preserver but certainly not a life giver God alone is the only life giver therefore obedience is the way of life to the living not to the dead because when the dead can't obey and even if they could obey they still could not buy that obedience bring themselves back to life again if life comes by the law then scientists could certainly could certainly generate life in the test tube of course I love the book of Galatians I'll turn back now to chapter 3 again the chapter we spent some time on this morning and note this magnificent verse 21 Galatians 3 and verse 21 which says is the law then against the promises of God God forbid for if there had been a law given which could have given life verily righteousness should have been by the law if there had been a law given which could have given life now Paul says if there had been which in first there never was such a law given right and it's true there is no such law and back to chapter 2 verse 21 I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law then Christ is dead in vain now this is why hospitals, doctors, medical practitioners, chiropractors, naturopaths and all these various people are quite unable to practice the healing art in a totally satisfactory manner because at their command they have the law and nothing more than the law they don't know the God of health as Jesus did as we are to know him and therefore by the application of law they are able reasonably successfully sometimes to preserve only that which life only that life which is left unfortunately of course drug medication doesn't even do that it destroys part of the life which is left and brings a person markedly near to an early death and to an early grave and naturally of course if, if um, we want to really have victory over disease victory over sickness then the only way is to have the life of God which is the health of God in your very being there's no other way but that let's come back now to ministry of healing I'll pass across as my time is skipping by I'll pass across to page 115 and the next paragraph I read says when the gospel is received in its purity and power what a wonderful statement this is it lays down the condition let's analyze the words we read so far when the gospel now what is the gospel it's the power of God it is the grace of God it is regenerating recreating energy it's a life force it's a stream of life which flows from God now when that gospel is received now if you receive the gospel you receive what that gospel is you are receiving the grace of God which is the power of God which is the regenerating energy and life of God which is recreative power you are re actually receiving recreative power into yourself now as Sister White goes on to say in its purity and we're talking now about the gospel not something called the gospel merely but the actual gospel in a pure form unmixed of course with human and satanic errors when that gospel comes to us in that way which it does these days we do know the gospel these days in its purity and in its power then what happens it is a cure for the maladies that originated in sin it the gospel and that gospel remember is the power of God it's the regenerating energy and life of God it is the actual health of God and when you receive the regenerating energy of God into yourself it regenerates you can't do anything else but that and when you receive the health of God into yourself and his health becomes your health and what better health than God's health there is no better is there that's perfect health we read further the son of righteousness arises with healing in his wings Malachi 4 verse 2 not all that this world bestows can heal a broken heart or impart peace of mind or remove care or banish disease fame genius talent all are powerless to gladden the sorrowful heart or to restore the wasted life now here we have a very very powerful sentence to restore which means to rebuild or give back what kind of life the wasted life and a wasted life is something which has been expended if you see a person who is wasted physically he's all just skin and bone isn't he but this goes further than that 
when you waste your vitality, your organs break down and death is reigning to a considerable extent in your, in your body. Now fame, genius, talents. Now what does genius and talent do? They apply law, don't they? Don't they? Right? Genius and talent applies law. These are powerless to restore the wasted life. And what do you suppose comes after this? The life of God in the soul, or in the body, in the being, is man's only hope. Now I rather like that because I have, don't have to go looking very far. I don't have to try it, nor any, I don't have to test any alternatives. This is man's only hope, so that's the only place I need to look anymore. I now read the next paragraph which goes on as follows. The love which Christ diffuses to the whole being is a vitalizing power. The love which Christ diffuses to the whole being is a vitalizing power. Now, this love is whose love? It's God's love. Because that's the only love which Christ diffuses. And diffusion means that it, uh, it just fills, it uh, permeates, it uh, radiates through every part of the being and it is a vitalizing force and the word vitalizing, of course, means life-giving in the sense of life-creating. Uh, once again, this is the grace of God, the regenerating, uh, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit. Every vital part, the brain, the heart, the nerves, it touches with healing. By it, the highest energies of the being are roused to activity. It frees the soul from the guilt and sorrow, the anxiety and care which crush the life forces. With it comes serenity and composure. It implants in the soul joy that nothing earthly can destroy, joy in the Holy Spirit, health-giving, life-giving joy. Our Saviour's words come unto me and I will give you rest are a prescription for the healing of physical, mental and spiritual ills. Though men have brought suffering upon themselves by their own wrongdoing, he regards them with pity. In him they may find help. He will do great things for those who trust in him. Now I hope tonight I can dispel any lingering, if there are still any lingering notions about the way God relates himself to disease. When a human being is sick and turns to the doctors or to the naturopaths or the chiropractors, he expects to be treated for that sickness, right? And the treatment, uh, well it might be in the case of doctors, drug medication, it may be... Uh, any, any number of various um, pills or potions or medicines or whatever. And so men treat sickness. God doesn't treat sickness. What God does is to flow his life into the sick patient. What God does is to replace the presence of sickness, I like that word presence, to replace the presence of sickness with the presence of himself so that his health takes the place of our sickness. And that presence of health within our human bodies, that is victory over sickness. And when Jesus Christ was upon this earth, he bore our sicknesses and carried our infirmities in his own person, but they were so totally contained and, and, uh, and eradicated and replaced, of course, by the health of God, and no sickness ever was seen in him whatsoever. Now, all around Jesus Christ were sick and sinful people and they were a picture of what he would have been if he had not had in himself victory over sickness and victory over sin. Now, but because he had victory over sickness and victory over sin, he was a picture of what everyone around him might have been if they had had the victory over sickness and the victory over sin. And today, of course, in this, in this last age of human history, when we find an increasing number of people sick and sinful around about us, we, because we are to possess victory over sickness and victory over sin, are to be living witnesses to what they would also be if they possessed the same victory over sickness and the same victory over sin. Question. How could he heal people if he didn't have that healing power within him? He couldn't. Well then what about us? If he would have that healing power, we should be able to heal others? Certainly. Today? Yes. And it's, happen it's, it's happening around the world too. But let me just finish. My time is almost gone. I'll, I'll answer the questions at the end of the study, if, you, if I may. Now, just in closing, I want to make the point that um, I want to make the point that uh, it's possible, of course, to take this just a little bit too far. 
to conclude that inasmuch as victory over sickness and victory over sin then is the eradication of sickness and death will never overtake us and we, we can be translated without uh, we, can live, we can live to a thousand years if need be until translation comes this ignores the fact that back in the Garden of Eden Adam and Eve sold out our human bodies to the devil and the broken law and this body is doomed to die and will die of old age when that time comes and while today we have victory over sickness and victory over sin we do not yet have victory over death 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26 says, or we'll go back to verse uh, 24, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when shall death be destroyed? When do we finally get victory over death? At the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. I turn now to later verses in the same chapter where I read these words. Now I say, now this I say, brethren, verse 15 on, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment... In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on immortality, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now, when death is swallowed in victory, of course, it means we have the victory over death. That means eternal immortality. Verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then today, right now, it is the privilege of every Christian to have total and complete victory over sin, over all known sin, of course, and sin in principle and at the same time to have total and complete victory over all sickness and disease a holy healthy people is what God is calling for to enter into the time of the latter rain and the loud cry and to finish the work in that age and generation